How you guys doing? Uh, nice uh, uh, chill Q&A stream after Dustin's show. That was a great show, wasn't it? I yeah. thought so. It was very <laughs> fun. Yeah, very yeah. fun. Yeah. No, I, I thought it was a uh, – we really – hit the nail on so many different things and we kind of like painted a big picture of why this is important. I thought it was just awesome. Uh, and we can say Dom, that it was completely unrehearsed and unprepared and we had no idea what questions you would ask. And then I know it actually worked out for the best because we were able to give our own perspectives. Yeah, no, yeah. I didn't prepare anything. I was just like, no. I'm going to go hang out with Dustin and it was great. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so uh, for the audience, we're we're just doing a Q and A here after Dustin's stream, and uh, you know this one's a lot more relaxed, no formalities. Uh, so yeah, Holy Smokes, we was the Holy Smokes channel, which is why I'm yeah. still puffing on my pipe, and we still have our drinks. Yeah, so this is <laughs> pre yeah. post smoke room with yeah. uh, Holy Smokes and Dustin. Yeah. Uh, Dustin Quick, he's amazing. I love that guy. He's just... Yeah, same. <laughs> yeah, he's awesome, and he's got some incredible guests on his channel. He, he had uh, Scott Hahn, John Bergsma, all these different people. Um, what's her name? Uh, oh, he's going to hate me for this. Margaret uh, something. <laughs> She's the temple theology lady. Uh, I can't oh. remember her name. Oh, he's going to kill me. Anyway, it's just great stuff. Um, yeah. Oh, we got some questions. <laughs> uh, okay. Question is, what are we supposed to be asking you about? <laughs> <laughs> the SSPX uh, mostly because that's what we've been covering. But I mean, honestly, anything. You can ask the line on, you can ask the, line on the Packers Rams on Monday. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anything. Yeah. Um, so, but wait, that's actually something that, uh, John, you're going to be on Laura's show on this on the 17th. Is that right? I just for, realized it's tomorrow. So I, I, I probably <laughs> oh, yeah, have some preparation right. to do because I, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> I've had three this week, you know, so yeah, uh, but I'm, I'm happy. I haven't been on her show yet. So it's, it's nice to make that connection. She's amazing. Yeah. She, she had me on, she had Andrew on. I think she had you on twice, Andrew. Um, yeah, she did. Yeah, she's great. Yeah. great. Yeah, it's going to be on marriage, uh, marriages and all those questions, uh, yes. which is pretty important. Yeah. Yeah. All right, guys. I thought you guys told me you had questions. <laughs> okay. Well, we, we can just start talking. We can just start talking. Yeah, uh, yeah. And if people want to ask questions or have something they've been wanting to ask, I us, have a question. What tobacco oh, do you have in your pipe, did. Andrew? What's what tobacco that? Tobacco do you have in your pipe? Oh, okay. Yeah, that there's a good question. Okay, so I like I really like the MacBaron tobaccos, um, and this is their this is their Navy Flake. Okay. You can nice. See it. Yeah, it's kind of a, an English blend um, with some of their uh, Black Cavendish inside it as well. I like that too. Um, it's really, it's really good. Um, I, I, it, it's the perfect blend of, um, you know, Burley and Virginia and yeah. Cavendish, and gives me that savory that I want, but yet like not so over overly dominant. Um, but uh, yeah. yeah, it's awesome. a favorite wine. I used to have a pipe that I actually bought in Ireland. I bought it in Tralee. It's uh, Southern Ireland, and like an idiot, uh, this was when I was in the Marine Corps. I decided. I'm just going to give it away because I was trying to quit uh, smoking like altogether. And like, come on, Dom, like if, if you want to quit smoking, that's fine. But don't give away a pipe you bought in Ireland, you know, so I regret, <laughs> I regret that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we do have a question here. Uh, uh, it's from Mike here. What do you miss most about the society? That's a tough question. Well, mm. I guess hanging out with people I know. Uh, yeah. Um, friendships right friendships. yeah friendships yeah yeah very very and it's good not to, it's yeah. not to say that those friendships ended or have to end i mean I, i'm still yeah. my communications with former friends they're still they're yeah. still friends it's a little bit more tenuous because of what's yeah. going on but no that that truly is the human element right the human element yeah. of yeah of uh, you know sharing you know with, with friends yeah and i gotta I say i sorry go ahead go ahead andrew Oh yeah, no. I was just saying, yeah, I grew up in just this great little small country community yeah. here in Montana, and the people are just wonderful. I and I grew up with the boy, the, the boys. Um, we went hunting together. Yeah. We, you know, yeah. wooden sword fights, um, airsoft wars. You know, um, yeah. we just had amazing experience together. My best friend to this day um, is from that, and um, uh, yeah, they're just they're amazing. They're they're, they're they're so many of these people. 
they're really drawn to, you know, traditional lifestyles, trying to move away from maybe some of the problems of the modern world. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. It gives them a, a depth of character. Uh, yeah. because they really are trying. They're just not they're not just going with the flow. They're trying to rediscover, you know, what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to live by the old ways? Right. And of course, as we know, yeah. that can become an exaggeration and you can right. go too far. But at the same time, like that is so praiseworthy. Um, and I, yeah. you know, I, one of the things I miss too, uh, because of course I come from a military family is how disciplined it is, right? Because it's a yeah. small, the smaller you get things, um, the, the, the more often organized and disciplined you can become. And mm -hmm. uh, the SSPX is very well organized when it comes to their execution of the liturgy, their training, uh, how everything is, is done. And, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, the SSPX really, it was my life that, that really gave me my love. Uh, for the Holy Liturgy of Holy Mother Church. And I will be forever grateful for that. You know, yeah. I always hate it when people, it, it's so it's so hurtful um, when people say, Andrew, you know, Andrew is uh, emotional. He, he's he got an ax to grind with the SSPX. He's been mm -hmm. hurt and now he's trying to go after them. Um, yeah. Because I've tried to say multiple times that that's not the case. I was never yeah. abused. I had incredible mentors. I had incredible teachers. Um, the people that I, I, I lived with and who taught me and the Dominicans and the SSPX priests, um, I still have a great respect for to this day, even if I disagree with them. Um, yeah. but I, don't, I don't have an ax. I don't have an ax to grind um, with them. I wasn't an abuse victim. Uh, yeah. I had a great upbringing. I had a great upbringing. Yeah. Yet still you have this recycled. Oh, he's just going after the SSPX. Oh, it's just emotional argumentation, which, by the way, um, all argumentation has an element of the emotion. That, 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 that's one of my favorites, right? You're arguing from emotions. Well, didn't you know that in Aristotle's classical rhetoric, pathos yeah. is actually yeah. a part of persuasion and everybody yeah. uses it because we're emotional creatures and we all have right. a heart. So you're always going to have emotion, an emotional aspect to your argumentation. You know, but these are the things that they do to just try to discredit our argumentation, to discredit the the legitimate problems we're actually trying to bring up and solve yeah. for the healing of these these divisions in the SSPX. And if we had an axe to grind, I mean, this would be horrible. But if we did have an axe to grind, we would say nothing. Yeah. And let them remain yeah. in their objective <clears throat> state of right. schism. Or we'd be uh, attacking, you know, like attacking them personally. You know, you know or, we, we have right. an obligation according to the will of God and you know the graces he's given us to to make this truth known and let the chips fall where they may. But it's it's the it's the opposite of an axe to grind. It's it's being done in charity because ultimately, and they're they're quick to say this, it's about the salvation of souls. This de does deal with the salvation of souls, and that's why we're doing it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another thing, one thing I, I missed was uh, I was part of this uh, 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 boarding school in the north of France. And uh, what's really interesting about this school, so it's an SSPX school. I have so many excellent memories from that school. But what's really interesting is that because of where it's situated, they had students from the UK, students from Belgium. They even had a couple Canadians, right? And then there was my school is the French same way, Dom. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. Yep. So it's a yep. it's SSPX thing. Okay. Well, what I found fascinating is that the school was uh, built uh, right below a World War I uh, uh, um, battlefield with craters from the bombs. And uh, the trees grew around all the craters and in the craters and everything. But during uh, recess or recreation, I don't know how, you, you know, I'm, I said all this in French, but uh, during that time period, you had the Belgians, you had the French, and then you had the, the British who had their own groups of kids, right? Yeah. And we would wage war. Now, I, little did I know, as a French person and as an American, I'm supposed to hate the British, right? Quote, unquote. <laughs> well, I'm the only one that spoke English that wasn't British. So what did I do? I joined the Brits. And I was saying things like, God save the queen. And I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> oh, man. That's great. That's good. Uh, but I made some oh, wonderful man. friendships. Yeah, and that, that was just such an awesome school. And uh, but so that's that's a, another positive. And I agree with the the. I think a, a lot of people in these in different sections of these movements realize there's something wrong with the modern world. There's something about its consumerist, uh, you know, structural, uh, you know, technological, you know, state power. There's something that's wrong here. We kind of yearn back for Christendom. And um, so, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. with both. Yeah. And at the same time, Dom. The view of a lot of the people in the society is that Novus Ordo priests don't get it. 
But if you mm-hmm. actually get to know some of them, they are living holy Catholic lives, praying oh, yeah. their office There's faithfully. There's a whole new young generation. Absolutely. Yeah. Praying the yeah. office faithfully, doing the best with what they can, submitting yeah. in holy obedience, visiting hospitals, going to, you know, to, to give extra emotion at any hour of the day. I mean, this is yeah. happening. This is what's going on. So right. it's, it's, you know, it, they, they haven't been given their due, but there are a lot of very good holy priests who are, you know, part of the Roman rite that, you know, the, the society would yeah. say is not, not really part of the church, which isn't true. Yeah, yeah. Let's see. I got some more questions here for you, for all three of us. Um, okay, here we have. My understanding is the Orthodox have the sacraments because they have valid apostolic succession. Did the illicit Lefebvre ordinations mean the SSPX do not have apostolic succession? No, that's not what it means. Um, uh, basically, uh, John, I'll, I'll let you answer this one. But uh, uh, yeah, yeah, apostolic succession, yes, they have it. It's about laseity, not validity, but. Yeah. Yeah. There's there, the way the theologians describe this. There's a distinction between material apostolic succession and formal apostolic succession. Material apostolic succession means that uh, there is an unbroken chain from the apostles to the bishop, where by you know the episcopal consecration, the laying on of hands, we can trace that act of consecration back to the apostles. Yeah. But it becomes formal apostolic sec- succession when the bishop has a juridical or canonical mission from the Holy Father, who was then in yeah. hierarchical communion, and then he's sent by the Holy Father. He j- doesn't just have the, the Episcopal powers, but he's sent to exercise those powers lawfully. Yeah. lawfully. That's yeah. what means, that's what formal succession, apostolic succession means. Gotcha, yeah. Um, that's interesting here from David. He says, uh, I'm wondering because it seems they needed permission to exercise the sacraments, so yes to the society. Uh, which is not even true of Protestants who can validly marry couples on their own, it seems. Well, here, what, what's what's crucial here is that it's the spouses that marry each other. They're the ministers. But the thing is, for a Catholic, you need a witness for the church that is lawfully sent. And so uh, and, and what, what that witness does is he recognizes the marriage that takes place. Is that is that how you guys see it? Yeah, I, will, I think I'm going to have to talk about this tomorrow a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Let's maybe becomes- not... Yeah, yeah, whether uh, well, a Catholic is subject to for marriage is subject to canonical form. Once one yeah. has been baptized and received by authority into the Catholic Church, if they ever want to get married, they're subject to the canonical form, which means they have to be married in the presence of a cleric who has the faculty to witness the marriage, along with two other witnesses. And mm-hmm. and so, and in fact, Pope Benedict um, uh, the Sixteenth eliminated the public defection prong. There was an exception where if you publicly defect from the church, you were no longer subject to canonical form. That's no longer the case. So anybody who's ever been baptized and received in the Catholic Church is subject to the church's canonical form. Well, a Protestant yeah. uh, is not. If they've never been formally received as a Catholic, then yeah. they're not subject to the church's canonical form, and hence the church could actually recognize their marriage as valid. The same question, Dom, is, is also with respect to those who have been raised in the society. And as I've mentioned before, if they've never been received by lawful authority, technically those who are married are not being are not subject to the canonical form. And if they want to enter the church, they'd have to make a profession of faith. The priest would have to do what's called a radical signation, which means we recognize the validity of the vows at the time they were given, but there are steps to take before the Catholic Church would recognize a marriage between society people who were never received in the church. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, two Protestants, a uh, 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 questioner, David, I think it was, two Protestants can be validly married, not because of the minister, because they're marrying each other. They're the ministers. Uh, but the thing about the Catholic is that because he's Catholic, he requires a minister to witness. And so it's not the priest marrying them, but the priest is required for validity. Because if you're saying yes, but you don't, fully know what it entails to say yes as a Catholic, then you're not really saying yes. Uh, if that, that's how I understand it. Um, oh, here's a question. Um, is pipe smoking obligatory for traditionalists? Ooh, <laughs> yes. That's yes. a big question. <laughs> yes. Don't you know that? It's in catechism. What, what's, the, what's the paragraph? Is it 120? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Well, again, it's part of that culture of like rediscovering Mm-hmm. the um the traditional ways you know yeah um, not just 
uh, the modern way of, you know, entertainment or the modern rituals that we do, you know, on our yeah. phones or on our TVs, you know, usually predominantly digital. Um, mm -hmm. But but like discovering things like crafts or pipe smoking or, you know, and often the authors that you're reading um, <clears throat> come from that era, you know, yeah. in the, yeah. um, you know, the 19th, uh, 19th and 20th century where, um, you know, whether it's G.K. Testerton or Hello Belloc or a lot of those amazing, yeah. you know, authors who had this culture of J.R.R. Tolkien, right, of pipe smoking. Uh, yeah. And so for me, yeah, for me, I mean, my so my father smoked a pipe um, because, of course, we were part of, the, you know, this culture and rediscovering this culture. Um, and I grew to just love that, you know, love that he smoked a pipe and the smell of it. And yeah. uh, it was something that we would do like as a brotherly camaraderie. Um, especially in hunting camp, you know, you're going through these extremely intense experiences together um, in the cold, sometimes getting turned around or lost, bringing down these beasts and then having to pack them out. Um, these are really, you know, these are experiences. And then you get together around the fire. And one of the things that you do, you know, you, you drink the, the scotch or the bourbon and, and, uh, <laughs> and smoke the pipes and cigars. And yeah. um, it's just something that we, you know, it's a part of the, the bonding and a part of that culture that uh, I think has a lot of value. And there were actually, there are actually a lot of saints who, uh, who smoked. I think the national Catholic register actually did yeah. a great article on like all the, all the um, uh, saints who either smoked or uh, did snuff like Padre Pio. He did snuff. <laughs> really? Pius the 10th liked snuff. He liked a good cigar. Um, <laughs> I think Pius the ninth as well, you know, so um yeah. yeah i mean it's it's part of it's part of you know a culture since since the discovery of tobacco you know it's become kind of a cultural thing and i know it's it's very frowned upon um mm. in today's and, and and considered taboo um but as with all things yeah. i mean alcohol and food can also be bad for your health can also be detrimental for your health um but if it's done in moderation then it's all right. You know, one of the things that I laugh about is that the people were like, oh, look at all the hundreds of chemicals that are in the tobacco smoke, you know, that you're doing. It's like, well, what about the hundreds and maybe even thousands of chemicals they're using on your food that you get from the supermarket, right? I mean, we're, yeah. we're inundated yeah. with chemicals, right? So yeah. we can do the best we can, do things with moderation, um, but this life is not all there is. And sometimes there are certain cultural practices that are still laudable that you can practice as a Catholic even in moderation. And uh, yeah, I mean, for me, like, I just love from the Lord of the Rings and J.R.R. Tolkien was so formative to me and is a part of my, you know, worldview and, uh, and beginning to see the story, how he reflected the story of salvation in a new light. Um, and the way that they have that, again, that brotherly camaraderie, because it was what I was raised with and because of J.R.R. Tolkien, it's one of the reasons why I still, you know, occasionally smoke a pipe. So I would say I hope that gives a little bit of insight into why Trot yeah. Trat kind of into it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Got a question here from uh, Colin. Uh, question for John. I understand that it's illicit according to the code under certain circumstances to attend SSPX masses due to moral slash physical impossibility. Am I mistaken? How does sui juris come in? Does that make sense, John? Yeah, it's not illicit to attend an SSPX. PX mass. I mean, what what the um, Ecclesia Day replies have said, if I could summarize it, is number one that the masses do not satisfy the obligation. Number two, you should never receive communion there. And number three, if you're going to go there, um, they haven't addressed whether you can actively participate. But if you, but if you do go there, you're not committing sin so long as you're not substituting it for your Sunday obligation or receiving communion. Mm -hmm. So whether it's licit, licity is not going to apply to the person who's assisting at the mass. It's going mm -hmm. to apply to the minister who does not have the faculty to say the mass and hence he's offering an illicit mass. So the yeah. question becomes not whether the mass for me is licit or, or illicit, but whether I'm actually participating in communicatio and sacris. Am I engaged in non-Catholic worship because this worship is not offered in union with the bishop? So there are a lot of opinions about all this. I'm not saying it's crystal clear, but again, moral theology dictates if there are significant issues and if this is a, this might be offensive to God, why would anybody want to run the risk? Why not just yeah. avoid it altogether and find another TLM or do the best you can with what you have? 
Yeah. And uh, I've, I mean, I've gotten this a lot in my com boxes, which is, well, what if there's nothing else but the SSPX? I'm, I'm sure that might be real somewhere, but. In well, what, what if world? there's nothing else but the old Catholics? What if right. there's nothing else but the Orthodox? Yeah. What if there's nothing else but a St. Epicontus priest who say the 62 missile? missile yeah. What then? It's besides I the point. Ask them yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. No, I think exactly. about, too, I mean, that this is um, an interest. It's a very interesting question, actually, because, I mean, you think about the Japanese Catholics who went hundreds of years mm-hmm. without being able to administer any sacraments except the ones that they could on their own, like baptism and marriage. Yeah. Right? yeah. Not being able to have the mass, but they did that because it, it was more it was important that you um, that you attend a Catholic mass, a Catholic service. That's really where it's supposed to happen. Um, and that this idea that you have to have a mass no matter what, even if it's the, the result of a rebellious movement or a schism, like yeah. that's not really a, I don't know, it, it just doesn't yeah. seem that that's really a Catholic way of thinking. Yeah, no. Yeah. It's kind of a pick and choose cafeteria liberal way of thinking, yeah. I think. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of which, here's an interesting, yeah. um, here's an interesting uh, tidbit. I don't know. Uh, how familiar you guys are with the writings of Father L- Leonard Feeney um, at all? You know what he stood but for. He but, was he was one of those um, people because getting into this, like, oh, you absolutely have to have um, the the sacrament, and it has to look baptism. exactly this way, right? So, to, like, you have to have water baptism, baptism of blood, and baptism of desire never mm-hmm. apply. Mm-hmm. Which, by yeah. the way, is uh, it's completely inconsistent with Catholic teaching, right? The Catholic the yeah. Council of Trent actually taught baptism of desire. The fathers and doctors of the church, they have all Quite taught, is. and uh, they've all taught yeah. this. Um, it's it's actually part because God is, we are bound by the means, by the sacrament, the form of the sacraments, and we're supposed to do it that way, but God is not bound by it. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, and so one of the interesting things that he fell into in this belief that you have, in this rigorism, this kind of sacramental rigorism, was that those who... Um, have been baptized, but who die not receiving the Eucharist cannot have the Blessed Virgin Mary as their mother. Only those who have received the Eucharist can actually say that the Blessed that? Virgin Mary is their spiritual mother, but those who baptized um, and they die, um, they will never have the yeah. Blessed Virgin Mary as their mother. I mean, isn't it interesting? I mean, it's crazy, the, the rigor yeah. Um, yeah. Of, yeah. of the system of thinking. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, because uh, because we all know the quip, right? That uh, we are bound by the sacraments, but God is not. And and I mean, that obviously can be misused. But I mean, look at the yeah. thief on the cross, right? Was right. that a, a water baptism? No, right. it was a baptism in the Paschal Mystery of Jesus Christ. So yeah, yeah I mean, Feeney's fundamental error was making a distinction between justification and salvation because Feeney actually mm. was forced to admit that justification means a person is in, is in a state of grace okay yeah so yeah. my question to father feeney is okay what if that person in the state of grace dies do they go to heaven well he then faces the contradiction of saying well he doesn't have water baptism wait a minute you just said he was in a state of grace okay he could be in a state of grace well he didn't have water baptism so ultimately what feeney held mm. is that you needed the baptismal character on your soul for salvation that's the ultimate heresy that he held it yeah. has to be because what else could it be water baptism in his mind was absolutely it's it's not just relatively necessary as catholic theology teaches but in his mind it was absolutely necessary which means he thought that the character itself was necessary for salvation and it's not the the character is actually ordered to the worship on earth and and actually to receive Mm -hmm. the eucharist the character is ordered to receive fruitfully the sacrament of the eucharist that's what it's for it's not necessary for salvation per se you could read the doctors and the fathers on all this so feeney was in in grave error fortunately i don't see a lot of people embracing that that's actually one of the errors that lefebvre i don't think did embrace and you know i think he he probably is responsible for most of the traditional errors right now being embraced by the extreme trads but that's not one of them archbishop lefebvre actually didn't embrace feenyism Yes, yeah, that's right. Well, what, one thing I, I want to, to bring up too, while we're on the t- this topic of Feniism, and this is where he he gets in, he gets into that reading of Scripture that because Jesus Christ said, "Unless you be born of water and the Holy Spirit, 
you cannot be saved. You cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, it has to be a water baptism, right? But what else did Jesus say? Would Father Leon Leonard Feeney also say that yeah. someone who didn't receive the Eucharist would never enter thing. heaven? Yeah. Because right. Jesus himself said, unless you unless eat the you flesh receive, of the Son of Man, yeah. you have no life no in you. No life in you. You yeah. have to hold to that. And the church has never taught that you have to receive the Eucharist in order to right. be saved. So you You're can saved. see yeah. already that he's inconsistent with what the, how the church interprets. And he's yes, fallen those, even uh, into this 200 years of those Japanese Catholics. Right, Andrew? The 200 years of those Japanese Catholics, none of them would have been saved. Right? That's right. Yeah. I know. Oh, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But then that's the danger of traditionalism, where you're reading scripture and you're reading tradition. You're saying this is the truth apart yeah. from the magisterium of the church. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, this is a great conversation. Let's see. We have another question here. Two more questions from Colin. This one is SSPX is mixing concept of the extrinsic cessation of law with epikeia. The latter is according to the will of the legislator and the former is according to the necessity of following the higher law. Is that accurate? It sounds good to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, th this guy is pretty technical. Uh, <laughs> the problem with the problem with Epikaia, which the society appeals to, and it's just a, such a fundamental error. Epikaia, you know, is is the virtue by which human law is suspended because it would frustrate the divine law. And as Andrew and I have completely, you know, we've said repeatedly, we're talking about issues that are part of the divine law. The fact that the Pope alone has the right to select bishops, the fact mm -hmm. that one must be sent by lawful authority. So one cannot appeal, appeal to Epikaia uh, to justify a circumvention of the divine law because Epikaia only operates to suspend human, human law or yeah. ecclesiastical law, you see? So anytime the society appeals to Epikaia, it's, it's, it's almost laughable, frankly. It, it, it's It's totally out of out of place it has no out of bearing bounds. upon the actual out of bounds. yeah it's it irregular yeah yeah right um colin here asks uh when is uh, uh robert cisco's article <laughs> on collegiality coming out <laughs> i've been beating robert up about this and i hope he's watching and if he's not i'm gonna call him after the show he's basically <laughs> done but he's tweaking and tweaking and tweaking you know, I, I, we spend hours on the phone, you know, each week because we've really delved into collegiality. And, and Robert is going to be an excellent resource on, on oh, this man. topic. Can't wait. And he wants it yeah. perfect before he releases it. But I'm going to tell you, he's going to support everything that we've said about collegiality. Yeah. Uh, uh, I won't make a promise, but I'll I'll make a material, you know, effort to get this thing thing done yeah. by uh, by next week. Uh, Colin also adds, though, that uh, MHTS, I'm not sure what that is, under Sanborn. Is releasing a treatise critique on the topic soon. Well, I'll so, tell you what, we've had correspondence with uh, Bishop Sanborn, Robert in no. particular, and there he could go. not answer any of our objections and he could not answer any of our questions. So we invite the bishop to come and debate collegiality if he yeah. wants to. And that's we can that acronym that. is, I, I believe that acronym is Most Holy Trinity Seminary. I think that's the okay. seminary uh, that Sanborn. I see. Born, so I see. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> Pine sap. Uh, uh, what do you guys think about the book? The Ryan flows into the Tiber. Ooh, there's a lot. Oh man, question. yeah, a long time ago. Yeah, uh, I yeah. Um, yeah. Oh man, that's that's a whole episode. Pine sap. You can't do this here's, to me. <laughs> well, here uh, here's what I'd give in a nutshell. Okay, go ahead. That better not be your only book that gives your only perspective <laughs> of the Second Vatican <laughs> Council. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's yes. Malachi Martin, man. That's my only authority, right there. I know. Yeah, yeah. because of course he's <laughs> writing from a journalistic perspective, right? Yeah, and yep. and he's looking at things very much so from like looking at the political machinations of yeah. what's happening in the church and the human <clears throat> element that God yeah. works through in order to speak to mankind and to guide. You know, I mean, when you look at the debates of any of the councils, right? I mean, you've got multiple sides arguing from different angles. Yeah. Um, but what ultimately matters is what the, the council releases, and then how the Pope guides and interprets those documents of the council, not just the battles that went on, not those who tried to get in their agenda, not any of that different stuff. If you mm -hmm. only look at a council from the debates, from the political standpoint and everything, you're going to have a false picture. So yeah. although there are many good and interesting things in that book, that better not be the only thing you're using to form yeah. shape your understanding of it. 
and that that's pretty much what I'd say in the but I, you know so I use it as a good reference uh, here and there and uh, to remember what he said or whatever but I, my issue with it was that it felt a, a little bit shallow theologically I, I had bigger questions and it was much more journalistic like you said and it, it I felt like it didn't do justice to some of the theological concerns of some of the people there which so right now I'm I'm reading uh I'm trying to read from all sides of the, all the aisles that were there. So Man, you're uh, a frustrated theologian, Dom. You're a frustrated <laughs> theologian. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I'm reading. Uh, you know, I read Ratzinger's uh, notes on it, and uh, reading Kungar. Uh, he's very, very critical, and uh, a lot of people don't like him. And I'm not sure yet how I feel about him. Oh well. But yeah, it, it's a lot of fun stuff. So uh, let's see. We have here. Uh, is there any realistic chance that the society could reunite with Rome, or is it, or is it the case that if they were not obstinately schismatic, they would already be part of the fraternity or another traditional group? Yeah, I, uh, I think it's it comes down to individuals at this point that have yeah. to leave. I don't think as a society they will come back. I, I hope they do. I obviously, we all hope they do. I realistically, I don't think they will. I think it's kind of yeah. now we're fighting for individual souls. I think. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Yeah, because at this point, it's been going, let's see, 1970, we're 2023 20, now. It's over yeah. 50 years. Yeah. Uh, we're getting into multiple generations now. And as you get into multiple generations, now um, you have this, this is our ecclesial family. Like this is the yeah. true faith. And it's very, very hard for, for you to be able to then reconcile. And I think so much has happened and it's become entrenched that unless there is a kind of divine intervention or in incredible flooding of grace, um, it's unfortunately, it sure looks like uh, it's going to be a permanent schism. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, not to be too pessimistic, but being a lawyer in the, the real world, you know, the business world, as that bank account grows, it's very hard for the leaders of that enterprise yeah. to give it up because point. if they do, Rome takes it over. OK, yeah. So there are human elements that are, as, as you guys even said, in terms of schism, it's a human, like Cardinal Burke, it, it's, a, it's a human act. It's a sinful human act. And that's what's driving yeah. this. It's not the theology, as I said months ago, if it were the theology, then where are all the society theologians coming out and, and, and challenging us on our positions? It's not that, unfortunately, for them. Yeah. Um, Malachi Martin. Total fraud, mostly total fraud. I actually don't know. I, I don't know that much about him, so uh, I'll defer to you guys. <laughs> pass. Pass. Yeah, All right. Pass. I don't know. Okay. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's just to me, he he seems to have he has an interesting background, honestly. Like, so he was a Jesuit priest, and then he was laicized, and he's written all these novels about, you know all the interior corruption and, and plays that happened around the time of the second Vatican council and within the church. And I you can definitely tell he has a predominantly pessimistic view yeah. of, yeah. of the church in our time. Um, yeah. And I just think he leaves a lot out, you know, like you were saying, John, where there, there are these faithful priests, right? Cause the Holy spirit works quietly with the mm -hmm. small people in the grassroots. It's not just what happens around the top and, you know, this That's bishop, a great point. Cardinal and all these things that are happening. You have these faithful priests who are helping, who are trying to be as faithful as they can, helping their flocks. You have these good bishops um, who are just there to try to feed souls. And those are the quiet people that don't get many media attention. Yeah. That's a great point. I mean, I think Windswept House there's there's a lot of truth to that the way it's unfolded since martin died um mm -hmm. and so it's a, it's worth a read but you know what i wouldn't devote my time to it i'd rather read theology in, in, in canon law but if you want to be entertained and you want to do something you know independently of your intellectual you know pursuits that's fine yeah um <clears throat> Uh, while he is a mad trad, I do appreciate some of Ro Ro Roberto de Matei's book on Vatican II, more as a reference. Um, yeah, what do you guys think about that? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, we, we've talked, and, and he's embraced the errors of the society on collegiality. I mean, he, he comes out as this reputable authority on collegiality, but he doesn't offer anything new, in my opinion, anyway, to the doctrinal issues concerning collegiality. We had this 
gentleman yeah. named Christ Pilled who referred to Matei. And I said, well, you know what? You, you're all saying the same thing. In society, Christ Pilled, Dave Matei, they all say the same thing, that what Lumen Gentium taught Lumen Gentium 21 isn't really traditional. Nonsense. It is. I, I mean, I can prove, and, and Cisco is going to prove in his article, that everything that was taught in Lumen Gentium were in the, were in the actual schemas of Vatican I. And we can name a dozen theology manuals where the issue of the, the double subject of the primacy and the munere and juridical mission and, and the like were, were consistently taught, even pre-Vatican I, but primarily in Vatican I and on to Vatican II was adopted. So I, I, I do think, you know, with all due respect, you know, he's a, he's a scholar, but I think he's completely wrong on collegiality. Yeah, gotcha. I, I've been working through his book on um, filial resistance to the Pope. Um, what is that? What is that called? Um, love of the papacy or something like that. Um, and he has this uh, this one chapter on what he calls devotion to the papacy. And um, I've read what other authors such as Father Frederick Faber have written. He written an incredible um, uh, tract. He, or it was a sermon, actually, that he wrote down called devotion, devotion to the papacy, devotion to the pope as well as the what um, Pius IX and Pope Pius X uh, and other popes have actually written on what devotion to the Pope looks like, right? Because mm -hmm. the, the papacy is actually a part of our faith. It's actually an article of our faith. And so it's not just this unfortunate, necessary governmental figure that we have to have. Mm -hmm. It's actually a part of God's divine plan. Right. Um, and, and we have a familiar relationship to the Pope and uh, what he presents as what he calls true devotion to the papacy is not in line with what has traditionally been presented as true devotion to the papacy. So unfortunately, he his perception has been colored by this traditionalist narrative. And that's not the only narrative in the church. Do the traditional Catholics have a great uh, contribution to be able to make? Uh, to the conversation of the church? Absolutely. But that is not the only way of viewing the world. That's not the only way of viewing the church. And if you just lock yourself into Matei's view, Quas, you know, Kwasniewski's view, Vigano, you know, any of these guys who are like part of this traditional Catholic movement, you're going to be locked into a box. And the Catholic Church and the and all the perspectives, the rich perspectives that come together and dialogue is so much more beautiful and big than that. Is. You know, Andrea, uh, this reminds me of uh, uh, um, a friend of mine. What's his um uh, can't remember his name anyway, but he talks about how there's the fact that there's this thing called constructive criticism, which is in fact something that happened uh, prior to the council and in other eras. But then you have like, like the Jansenists, for example, where it's, it's the critical spirit. Uh, so it's not like they didn't have anything positive um, amidst many errors to offer. It's that they were doing it the wrong way. That's right? exactly right, Dom. Yeah. yeah, and so I do. I do believe in a a constructive criticism, of course. Yeah. Uh, in fact, you know this or any other papacy. In fact, I can think of various papacies where I was like, "Oh no, 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 no," and uh, but that's different from from you know creating division. That's the difference. I really think. Yeah. Um. Anyway, uh, let's see. What else do we have here? Uh, <laughs> tea or coffee, and if either. And if either says coffee, ask them why they're wrong. Oh, my. Wow. <laughs> Throwing down the gauntlet, Josh. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely uh, coffee for me. What do you say? Neither. Tom? Scotch. Oh, <laughs> yes. oh, you would. You would, John. Oh, how am I supposed to see if I'm going to pick between the three? I'm going to go with scotch, too. But since he didn't present that as an option, um, I would have to say of the two that I prefer, I would prefer coffee. However, my wife loves tea. She's a major tea aficionado. Is that how you yeah. say it? Um, and she's introduced me into like that ritual and a lot of these great teas and everything. So um, I really do appreciate both. They're they're both very good. Uh, if you want political machinations of counts of councils, read Jenkins' Jesus Wars about Chalcedon. It makes Vatican II look bland. Again. <laughs> This is so true. So true. So great. True. That's great. Point. great. I haven't yeah. heard anybody bring that up before. Yeah. Oh, man. It's it, it, especially recently, I've been talking to a friend of mine who does a lot of work around Chalcedon. And the stuff I'm hearing, I'm like, wait a minute, I've heard that before. Where have I heard that before? Oh, yeah. Vatican, too. It's the same stuff. It's the same, same. political fighting. Absolutely. Fighting. 
yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, uh, could you guys give uh, some book recommendations that uh, we should read about uh, the council? Uh, uh, real quick, I would uh, I would say uh, definitely I liked I liked a lot Father Nichols' uh, conciliar octet. I thought it was really good. Um, so I'll, I'll give that one. What do you What do you guys think? Well, I would say read the documents themselves. I've got a number yeah. of translations in my library, and I've spent time reading them. It's so important, guys, to read the actual texts. And if you can't read Latin, at least use multiple English translations and compare what they're saying. But read the text and become familiar with the texts before you can make any type of discernment or judgment upon them. Instead of the yeah. commentaries, the commentaries are great, but you have to have familiarity with the text to actually enter into the discussion. I agree. I completely agree. Yeah. Oh. Um, let's see. Give some documentation. Uh, why are all traditionalists Baroque? Why don't any want to recover Feast of Fools and Bible divination? I'm not sure what that means. You guys understand? <laughs> I, I think so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, because, you know, the, so this, it's actually a good question because it gives a little bit of insight into the traditionalist way of looking at things, which is mm -hmm. they want to recover traditions, but but certain traditions, right? Mm -hmm. Certain things from a, it's kind of like archaeology, you know, archaeology, oh, archaeologism. Archaeologism. Yeah, archaeologism. Thank you. Yeah. Archaeologism. Yeah. Um, which is like, so just, yeah, you don't just go and recover something that's old because of it, because of it being old, because right? old past 12, um, yeah. like that's, yeah. you don't, you, you don't necessarily need, like, that's not a good perspective to have, but at the same time, there are good things that can be recovered. And that was part of the process of the reforms of the second Vatican council was trying to bring, um, some of those things that had faded away in the middle ages and in other time periods, um, that we actually had for the first thousand years of the Roman rite. Uh, and and would act, which actually joined us um, closer to all of the Eastern rites as well. Um, I actually have a Byzantine Catholic priest friend, and he tells me that the Reformed rite, um, in so many ways, actually recovered so many of the things uh, previously in, in the first thousand years that that were more closely. Um, uh, in union, you might say, or the same in conformity with the way that Eastern Rite Catholics and the Orthodox and et cetera were also worshiping. So there were a lot of things, really good things that were recovered uh, from that. But again, that's up to the church to discern what, I mean, as the wise steward, right? The church is the one who's been appointed by Christ as the wise steward to bring forth from the treasury both old and new. And and I think that's that's one of the unfortunate rabbit trails that you end up in with traditionalism is it's like new is always suspect. You can't have new, but as Michael Lofton has pointed out very well on multiple videos, um, when a uh, Eastern Catholic or those look at like the Tridentine, right? Uh, they're like, look at all of these novelties. Oh my gosh, look at all yeah. these liturgical novelties. There's all kinds of liturgical yeah. novelties that that's weren't right. done in the first thousand years, right? But that's yep. part of what the church can do as part of that continual renewal of the liturgy, especially according to the times. Um, and what and I've said in the church in that, yeah. Yeah, no, that's great, Andrew. And, and, and what I've said and what Michael has said is that if you compare the, the 62 Missal to the early liturgical celebrations, the dichotomy is much worse. The lacuna is way larger than if you compare the Novus Ordo with the 62 Missal, the 62 yeah. Missal. I mean, there's no comparison, right? So if you want to talk about, you know, whether, you know, this particular missile is totally an opposite to this one, all you have to do is look at the tradition of the church, read Fortescue, read Jungman, read the way the masses were celebrated, and compare that to the 62 missile. You wouldn't recognize them. You wouldn't think they're the same religion in some respects when you, when you do that. So you, again, we've talked about this, but it's the, the, the total totality of circumstances and historical context that you really need to evaluate these things. You can't do them in isolation. Right. You can't compare 60 to 69, and that's the end of it. You can't do that's it. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. My friend Zach is saying, avoid Malachi Martin. Avoid him like the plague. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, don't, I don't know. I haven't read him. Uh, so, but... Um, yeah, uh, I'm I'm running, I'm running out of steam. What about you guys? You want to keep going? Sure. Yeah, whatever you want, Don. I'm fine. 
Yeah. Uh, well, look, I think we got all the questions. I'm just, uh, th- I'm so happy with that episode we did with Dustin. Uh, it's just, it, you know, it was just a great creative conversation. Uh, I'll make sure I post it in my community tab on YouTube and I'll spread it. I'll share it on, on Facebook and other places. Um, so uh, how about this? Let's do some uh, parting words. Cause uh, yeah, I'm crashing. So uh, <laughs> uh, uh, let's start with John. Uh, uh, anything you want to say about, um, uh, you know, the, the state of the church today, some encouraging words, maybe, you know what I mean? It's not as bad as you think. I mean, that's what I would say. It's bad, but it's always been bad. We can talk about post-Trent. We can talk about post-Vatican I in the old Catholic schism. We can talk about post-Vatican II and the society schism. We can talk about the Donatists and the Nestorians and the Arians. It's always been bad. There's a human element of the church. We're all subject to original sin and the decisions we make, but we have to stay within Holy Mother Church within the bark of Peter. Again, I keep emphasizing when the church says that there's no salvation outside the church, that doesn't mean this invisible body of believers who profess the faith. It means the visible hierarchical juridical structure that Christ established. And Christ is going to save those who are in that structure, not not outside of the structure. So please, dear friends, let's remain within the bark of Peter. If we have to suffer, and if we don't like all the decisions of the Pope, well, welcome to the Roman Catholic faith, because that's the way it's been for 2,000 years. Let's stick it out, let's gut it, and let's let's persevere to the end. Excellent. Andrew, any parting words? Absolutely. We, we've been seeing some very interesting developments uh, in the in the traditional Catholic movement right now. Recently, there have been two things that have really stood out to me. Um, One of them was that um, uh, Dr. Taylor Marshall was recently thrown under the bus by the Rorate Chile uh, group um, and basically blamed for uh, as being the chief um, reason and his with the whole uh, throwing of the Pachamama, you know, the being being, uh, in cahoots uh, with the throwing of the Pachamama, uh, uh, statues into the Tiber and everything and uh, blaming him and, and a lot of his rhetoric and his channel for, you know, the, the suppression of, you know, the, the, the traditional Latin mass or the, the 1962 forum. And it just goes to show some of the fruits, you know, and he felt, you could tell from his video, he felt very hurt. He felt very betrayed by that. that they would try that yeah. they would throw him under the bus like that. Um, and then the second, you know, the second one, was um, the the group that produced the Mass of the Ages. I thought they said something very good, which was that whether you think it's true or not, um, there is this common perception of traditionalists that we are negative, uh, <laughs> that we are tearing down, and this is something that needs to be changed. And yeah. I thought that that was a very courageous um, recognition. You know, let's, let's actually come to the table, um, whether you think it's true or not, and we gotta, we gotta do something different. We gotta change things if we're going to recover um, the message, recover the movement, you might say. Mm-hmm. Um, so my my advice would be don't put all your eggs in one basket. Do not put all of your eggs in the basket of the traditional Catholic movement, just like you wouldn't want to put your eggs in, all the ba- in the basket of the charismatic movement or any other movement of the church, right? That is not the church. Um, it is a movement trying to recover certain things of the church and pursue certain ends. And they're part of this larger dialogue within the church, but it all happens within the context of the church. And don't put all your eggs in that basket. Put all your eggs in the basket of Holy Mother Church and have an open-mindedness to be able to come to the table and say, yeah, everybody has really good perspectives. And and we need to recognize um, if we happen to identify or work, be working in a particular movement, let's not only only um, look, look at it through rose-colored glasses, but let's say, what are things that we could work on? Uh, because there are definitely things that need to be recovered in the traditional Catholic movement, especially positivity. Um, what are the fruits? Um, ask yourself this. What are the fruits of being tuned into that? Um, and I would include like sites like Church Militant or LifeSite News or 1 Peter 5, being tuned into these sites that are predominantly negative toward the life of the church, you know, that that emphasize only what is wrong with the church or only what they think is a revolution or a corruption in the reforms of the second Vatican council or whatever, and realize that there's a broader perspective and think about what, what impact that negativity, that, that, that predominant negativity has on your own personal life, on your own spiritual life. 
um, because it, that that's what it comes to what we said in one of our last episode or the episode we just did with Dustin Quick is that true reform starts with the conversion of individuals. Saints, just like Peter Crave said, the solution to crisis is the 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 formation of saints. Saints are. And that was the driving force of the counter-reformation. Those who didn't go along with the reformers, starting their own new groups and new churches, but those who actually stayed within the church became great saints and reformed the church from within. That's what we're calling us to. And it's such a positive, hopeful way of being Catholic in today's world. Excellent. Excellent. Well, gents, uh, make sure you like, subscribe, comment down below. Um, support us on Patreon. <laughs> Thank you to both of you, and we'll see everybody next time.